Hello, my name is Rebecca Sousa, and I am an AmeriCorps VISTA housed with the Maine Department of Education. I'm specifically working with the Maine School Safety Center and the Office of Student Support Services. And I'm really excited to be able to spend some time with you during SEL Day. Thank you for choosing to dive into food related issues with me. The themes of SEL Day this year are self awareness and finding common ground and pursuing common good. I couldn't think of any better themes to support food awareness this year. Let's talk about examples of common ground. Food is central to our experience as humans. Everyone must eat to live. Honestly, many of us live to eat. It's an integral part of our life that can foster our identity, health, belonging, interpersonal connection, and happiness. When we look at a person's social emotional health, if their food life is not healthy and secure, we can expect that to bleed over into their emotional and social lives too. Self-awareness and self-regulation can be influenced by the chemistry taking place in our body because of what we've eaten. This is why food is an important thing to look at when talking about social emotional learning. Food affects our relationships. Memories are made coming together at the cafeteria during lunch with friends or joining extended families to feast during the holidays. Shared meals signify togetherness and where community might be lacking, breaking bread together can be the tie that binds people. Feasts and fasting mark the seasons for many religions and that unifies practitioners with other believers. Food and food culture is inextricable from our human experience for our physical survival and also for our emotional health and well being. And that brings us to relate with one another. Food is also medicine, such as chicken soup to cure a cold or ice cream to mend a heartache. Some food decisions are more responsible than others, but they all count. Those are examples of how food can be reflected on from every SEL competency. We can talk about our food choices and food behaviors really broadly as food culture. Hopefully several times a day, most of us participate in our food culture, but unfortunately there are thousands in our state who are denied this joy. Some don't have the avail availability of their choice foods. If they live in a food desert, for example, if they eat food that can't be found in a consolidated local grocery store, or if they're limited in their part in their transportation, they might not be able to have food choice. Others are denied access because of political, economic, or social factors. Maybe they don't have the funds to purchase food, or food isn't distributed equitably across communities. It's important to challenge existing understandings behind food insecurity in Maine. That's how we can close the equity gap and improve access to health and have culturally appropriate food for all Mainers, focusing on collective responsibility and encouraging collaboration. We find common ground and pursue common good. Food culture is defined here. Food culture are the values, norms, beliefs, and practices of a group that define, shape, root, and reproduce their everyday behavior systems and imaginations related to food, agriculture, and nourishment. What does that look like next to our core competencies? Self-awareness. Let's take a second to consider our own relationship to food. Does it feed into your identity? If you say, I'm kosher or I'm keto, does the portrayal, availability, or unavailability of your food choices contribute to how you feel relative to the world around you? How do you feel as a member of community? 
college students, for example, reported feeling like they were not worth food when they struggled with food insecurity. They resented the students who were doing well, and they themselves internalized a lot of negative messages about their worth. As adults, being aware of our perceived bias towards poverty and food insecurity is also important if we're to be compassionate neighbors and allies for struggling people. This is self-awareness. For self-management, I have developed materials for the main school safety center because social behavioral dysregulation is a big concern with kids facing food insecurity. Part of our body's programming involves releasing cortisol when our blood sugar dips. This same mechanism that helped our ancestors hunt successfully and fight off competitors now looks like being cranky, hyperactive, aggressive, impulsive, or antisocial. When we're hungry, we become reactive. We have trouble focusing or being calm. Helping students manage is essential to safe school environments. It is no less important that we, as adults, also tend to our physical needs. Decision making SEL is exercised when we recognize low blood sugar, we take corrective actions. Being our best selves comes only from managing our needs. I'm going to lump social awareness and relationship skills together in relation to food. I've already emphasized that eating can be an important social activity. A table is a great place to build relationships. We still have to flex those SEL muscles though. Being cautious not to assume that your gluten-free friend wants to come to the community pasta dinner is really good. Even better, if the organizers advertise inclusive menus for a broad range of dietary considerations, that really helps foster community, helps people feel seen and know that they matter and they belong. Being aware of people's food culture is a great way to demonstrate that they are important. So a quick review, our physical needs have to be met for us to be at our best. Just think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I think most of this audience is engaged in teaching and student support. So I wanted to emphasize that students who feel fed, clothed, sheltered, and safe be better able to focus on their SEL skills. All of this is fundamental for students to be in a good place for learning. Here on the diagram, I've called it optimized living. For us to ask them to be regulated, attentive, and engaged, we have to address the foundational physical, emotional, and social needs. In this place of wellness, students will feel like they belong, they'll feel like they matter, and they will reward us. As an adult, I seldom really examine how food alters my own self-regulation. Do as I say and not as I do, right? The days that I resort to a high sugar breakfast pastry to go or swing into a drive through it's much harder for me to be my best self. I am also intimately familiar with the feeling of hanger, caffeine fluctuations, sugar jags. If I find myself tired and short tempered and easily frustrated, I'm still surprised when I have a well balanced snack that almost magically I feel more patient and relaxed. I realize that I haven't been eating in a way that respects my body. Physical needs are foundational to our wellness. We have to eat well to be well. What are some of the obstacles to eating well? The University of Connecticut's Rudd Center for Food Policy and Health in 2017 found food, beverage, and restaurant companies spend almost $14 billion per year 
on advertising in the United States. More than 80% of that promoted fast food, sugary drinks, candy, and unhealthy snacks. This QR code links to their findings. The theme of this SEL day is self-awareness. So I would invite you to think what social and emotional appeals impact your food decisions. I moved to a farm in the middle of nowhere, Maine, and for years my kids didn't even think we had internet. We've relaxed a bit as the older ones have become teenagers and they need to know how to use computers, but we're still generally screen avoidant and careful about what we consume. Still on a daily basis, we see a Burger King ad pop up during a YouTube video that's aimed at kids. If we're watching a family movie, the hero is standing there eating a bag of Doritos. Even our popular science magazine has sold real estate to Weight Watchers. Big business invests big money in getting their products in front of our eyes. It appeals to our emotion, convincing us that we'll be smarter, cooler, or happier with their product. We used to have consumer science and home economics classes that helped us to be thoughtful shoppers, but today many people learn how to buy from people who are trying to sell them something. Our food choices are foundational to our health, but our health is not often the priority for the people advertising to us. For example, every time I eat at a certain fast food restaurant, I feel like garbage afterwards. But every time I see the logo, I get a little jump in my heart. Maybe it's because my grandmother took me to the playground there every weekend that I was with her. Maybe it was because it provided one of the few warm meals that I remember eating as a kid. The warmth of those memories still resonate 30 years later. <laughs> Maybe marketing folks are just really good at their jobs. Look how much fun these people are having drinking soda. Even as an overeducated adult who knows they're trying to sell me a product, I still smile along with their models or with Will Smith. People are complicated. As a main hunger core Vista, I have a couple of big goals. As a cohort, we are trying to improve equitable access. I stumbled into this job. I had worked as an ed tech in the local village school but I had an emergency birth with our fifth child and that pulled me out of school early and I missed the rest of the year. That summer, I missed my students and I heard through the PTA that they were looking for volunteers to man the summer nutrition site. I thought it was a great opportunity to catch up with kids. In case you don't know, there's a strong relationship between food insecurity and the need for additional classroom supports and special education services. I volunteered at the summer lunch site, but most of the kids who I knew who needed nutritional support never showed up. Two years later, I applied for a job at the county level to help grow a program that might be able to reach students in need while the school was closed. In the process, I was put in for this job at the DOE. And after meeting with the supervisor, I couldn't pass up the opportunity to work with this amazing team and hopefully make an impact at the state level. So while my current position is less hands on than it would have been working for the county, I still keep those local kids in mind. I think of them when I offer interventions. I wonder what will reach them, what will help them have better access to food and what will support their families. I'd like to share with you about healthy, culturally appropriate foods. The number of calories a person eats in the day is not the whole story of hunger. The health value of the calories is also important. In this country, we have people who are both undernourished and obese. It would be best also if everyone had access to healthy foods that they were comfortable with. And that's food that's culturally appropriate. 
As we've talked about, our food culture is central to our identity. It ties us to our families, to our traditions, our religions, our values. Food sovereignty is another important component of this conversation. Do all people have a right to define their own food and agriculture systems? Well, last November, Maine as a state said yes. Voters passed a statewide referendum to declare all individuals have a natural right to grow, raise, harvest, produce, and eat food that they choose. Campaigners said this was a chance to wrestle control of food supply back from large landowners and giant retailers who often have no connection and subsequently no investment to the community. This was a strong win for the ending hunger goals. We want to change the narrative. So over recent years, we've shifted from blaming impacted people to adopting a trauma informed perspective. So instead of asking what's wrong with you, we ask what happened? With the pandemic, we have seen how many families were living on the cusp of poverty. What happened? An unprecedented time of economic uncertainty, unemployment, health emergencies and shifting markets. Folks who used to donate to food pantries lined up to receive instead. The pandemic shined a light on the fragility of many folks financial situation. It would be great if we could all recognize that any of us is just a few bad days away from needing support ourselves. If we can operate from that place of solidarity, that is the best chance of overcoming shame culture and fostering true community caring. As a cohort, we also want to encourage a focus on collective responsibilities. Systems are the result of individual actions over time. As an example, I want to talk about the male privilege of pockets. Right. When I borrow my husband's jacket, the pockets are big enough and there are so many that I can put a book, two phones, a wallet, a diaper for each of our three babies, a partridge and a pear tree in there. Ladies pockets are not functional a lot of the time. My sweetie argues that if women wanted pockets, we would have them. And I get so mad because I wasn't there when that decision was made. And now I have to fight against the fashion system or walk around one handed or shop in the men's section. The current food system is no different. The way food is produced, prepared and shared has been built over time. And explicitly or implicitly. The same functions that led to ladies clothes without functional pockets. Have led to consolidated grocery stores. People separated from the land, not knowing where our food comes from, not having the skills or tools to process food in our home, receiving corporate marketing messages that may conflict with our best interests in health. Only by acknowledging and claiming our collective responsibility can we start to reclaim and restructure our food system. Finally, Capacity building and collaboration across sectors. For me, this means strengthening relationships. I am not looking to convince individuals to do better. Outside of flexing their SEL muscles in relation to food. I'm looking at the big picture, the systems, the cultures. It takes organizations and infrastructure and cooperation to address the great health disparities and inequities facing portions of our population. This is best with collaboration across sectors. Hunger often stems from poverty, which then relates back to the job market, housing access, health, uh, access to medicine, um, healthcare systems, criminal justice systems, social supports and services, education, etc. This QR code will link you to my resource hub where you can find more information about food security.
Food insecurity is defined by the U.S. Department of Agriculture as people experiencing either reduced quality, variety, or desirability of diet without or with little indication of reduced food intake. Low food security is a change in quality. Very low food security is when there is a disrupted eating pattern and reduced food intake. I share that, but I still like to keep in mind this quote. It's not how many worms the bird feeds its young, but how well the fledge, fledging flies. Helping people live into their full potential should be the focus. On the right hand side, I have child poverty statistics, and you'll have to forgive me because the focus of my work is young people, which also means they are the center of my research. I share this graph by the numbers because it gives a more complete picture when the food insecurity st statistics are examined by percentage. This food insecurity rate chart comes from the Maine Community Action Program statewide needs assessment that was published in, I believe, 2001. By percentage, Cumberland County had the lowest rate of food insecurity of any county in the state. For you numbers people, I don't know why it's the lowest out of all of the data, um, but everything is pretty in line county-wise with what I've seen from Good Shepherd too. So we'll just move on from that for now. Back to Cumberland County, lowest percentage, but if you look at the number of children, it is the highest number of children living in poverty. So the prosperity of that area can mask huge pockets of need depending on how you look at the statistics. The take home from this information is that food insecurity is not just a them issue that happens in cities or far away from here. In Maine, we have a good number of neighbors who struggle obtaining either the quantity or the quality of food that they need to sustain active lives, to work and learn and grow and thrive. Food system is another term that I would like to take a minute to unpack with you. This QR code will take you to the site where I pulled this Nourish Food System map. It goes into great detail because it also examines food traditions, ecosystems. It talks about analyzing food ads and food literacy. Um, and I apologize because in order to get it to fit, it's probably a little bit blurry. <coughs> I'm trying to pause, but please bear with me. All right, so we're looking at the nourish food systems. Food systems are interconnected activities, people, policies, and cultural norms that shape how our food is produced, processed, transported, consumed, and disposed of. We've already talked about the social system involved. For economists, this is where demand is born. Our social network influences our consumption. I apologize again that it's blurry, but this circle of influence is, and, and I have it listed here, food culture, education, access, media messaging, social networks. This forms each individual's food literacy, which then informs where they invest into the system. Of course, by way of the political system, which is research, subsidies, regulation, trades, taxes, that kind of thing. So these funds go into restaurants, grocery stores, food wholesalers on one side, or maybe they go to invest in farmers markets and community shares and co-ops. These suppliers use money to buy food, maybe from the mainstream big farm systems or maybe from local farmers. 
In either case, there are farmers and workers who contribute labor and know-how along with seed, energy, water, sunlight, soil to grow food. This feeds into the environment, land use, biodiversity, climate change, nutrients in our groundwater. When these biological systems are not working sustainably, it may decrease supply or quality of food available in the long term. Again, I wish this were an away problem, but even locally, there's a couple trying to start an organic farm down the road in Midcoast, Maine, and they found forever chemicals in their soil. We're looking at big picture system stuff. It is complicated and interwoven. The danger here is inadvertently contributing to an unjust system. So here's a great exercise for those SEL muscles. In our current system, probably built by pocket haters, there's a lot of unchecked power and wealth concentrated with multinational corporations, often at the expense of small scale producers, indigenous people, subsistence farmers, and local economies. Workers throughout the food system, especially migrant workers, face unsafe working conditions and frankly, unjust workplace environments. The focus of high yields at all costs, such as the use of chemicals, has threatened biodiversity, the economy, and the climate. Fortunately, it's not too late to reclaim the system. Working together, creating coalitions, promoting justice, creates food systems for everyone. This information comes from the Maine Ending Hunger Corps report called Everyone at the Table. The groups in Maine who are significantly impacted by food insecurity include single parent households, people with disabilities unable to work, people with low wage jobs such as home health aides, grocery store and restaurant workers. I was recently surprised to find that 10% of teachers are food insecure. Children are also disproportionately affected by food insecurity. I remember the first time I met Craig Lapine who oversees this project. He struck a chord in me saying, the biggest risk factor of being hungry in Maine is just being a kid. Whew. This information is titled Equity Gap. These are the gaps we are trying to close. We seek just solutions for these impacted groups. Unfortunately, problems are compounded when the group in need is also disenfranchised. Other disproportionately affected populations include BIPOC folks. Black children are three times as likely to live in poverty. Native children are twice as likely as their white classmates to struggle with food insecurity. According to Ending Hunger 2030's report, almost 52% of African immigrants face food insecurity, 40% of all black households, 30% of American Indian people, 28% of all people of color, as compared to 14% of white people, are not secure in their access to food. So here we see food work is equity work. Our neighbors have a right to food that is not being upheld. As a bonus, hunger does not exist in a vacuum. It is interwoven with a number of systemic and historical oppressions and injustices. So hopefully talking about food access opens the door for more holistic conversations around equity. Addressing equitable access involves engaging stakeholders, being inclusive in the analysis and the decisions, and then placing more value on those local community need conversations rather than being drowned out with other messaging. This top graphic, my left, shows an aspect of our broken system. Here we have a cycle of economic insecurity, food insecurity, 
and poor health. No matter where someone enters into this cycle, they can get caught in it very easily. Children growing up in food insecure homes are more affected by poor health, which will impact their education and then their employment opportunities. This will lead to economic insecurity in their adulthood. Often food is the first budget item to be compromised to make ends meet. It's usually the most flexible. This creates a food insecure home where children are going to experience nutritional deficits, leading to decreased engagement and increased mental health disorders. Their chronic health struggles are going to lead to decreased economic opportunities, rinse and repeat. While it's not directly today's topic, I do want to point out that every piece of this equation has some very powerful and very influential people at the wheel, driving the system to their advantage regardless of the cost to others. Fixing food insecurity is not just about giving people food. There is way more than enough food. In fact, under Food for Peace Title II, the United States federal government sent 1.6 million metric tons of food out of the US and, and into the world. 1.6 million metric tons. 3,000 millions would be billions? I'm, I'm not good. <laughs> food is not the problem. There is a ton of food. I would like to read you a quote. Here is one of the most familiar forms of the vicious circle of poverty. The poor get sick more than anyone else in the society. That's because they live in slums, and I know slums look different in Maine. They live jammed together under unhygienic conditions. They have inadequate diets. They cannot get decent medical care. When they become sick, they are sick longer than any other group in society. Because they are sick, they are often losing wages and work and they find it difficult to hold a steady job. Because of this, they cannot pay for good housing or for nutritious diets or for doctors. At any point in the circle, particularly when there's a major illness, their prospect is only to move to an even lower level and to begin the cycle round and round towards even more suffering. In a nation with enough technology that it could provide every citizen with a decent life, it is an outrage and a scandal that there should be any such social misery. Only if one begins with this assumption is it possible to pierce through the invisibility of 40 million to 50 million human beings to see the other America. We must perceive passionately if this blindness is to be lifted. A fact can be rationalized and explained away, but an indignity cannot. This quote is from a life-changing book that I read by Michael Harrington called The Other America. And unfortunately, it is as true today as it was in 1971 when he wrote it. We have been wrestling with the same kinds of issues for 50 years. All that to say from the perspective of the people that it is meant to serve, this system is broken. The broken system is perpetuated with messages of individualism, paternalism, and neoliberalism. These were new words to me, but I understand them to mean putting the responsibility for not having pockets, or healthy food back on the individual. Paternalism has a root meaning in father. This father restricts freedom. It restricts responsibility of lesser people for their supposed best interest. Neoliberalism is focusing on prosperity in the economy and market-oriented policies instead of the concerns of the people. Now, I don't have any great answers here because I have heard myself and others in food security work leaning on some of these messages like, I want to improve awareness if they only knew. 
when you know better, you do better. But again, this is a great opportunity to flex my own SEL muscles. I need to examine if my values are perpetuating the problem or giving voice to underserved populations. I invite you to examine these with me for a moment. Do any of these phrases resonate with your understanding around poverty, emergency food pantries, people who use food stamps, people who need public assistance, etc.? I'll read them and then we can think about them together for a minute. Vote with your fork. Communities can't take care of themselves. Their failures are a failure to listen. Build it and they'll come. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Some people put more emphasis on food charity instead of attending to equitable economies and accessible food systems. They also consider good versus bad food and food cultures. I'm going to give us all a moment to read this list and reflect. Perhaps you can set a new intention going forth from today, not only to stop perpetuating these sentiments, but to have eyes wide open for messages that perpetuate individualism, paternalism, and neoliberalism that distract from addressing the root of the problem, the system. <clears throat> this QR code will bring you to the source of information on this page. I cannot emphasize enough that I am not trying to fire you up about food justice as individuals. I am inviting you to be more aware of your own food culture and to extend awareness outside of your immediate experience to tap into the social emotional strength and flex those SEL muscles and contribute to the critical mass necessary to make sure that all of our neighbors are fed, fed well, and fed in a way that affirms their culture, beliefs, freedom, and humanity. Let's find common ground in our enjoyment of food and use that to fuel our work towards common good. Food Solutions New England is a network working on food systems in a way that builds democracy, racial equality, sustainability for the environment, our economy, and our cultures. Founded on trust across community connections, diverse people, organizations, and networks come together to create a thriving system. This is their QR code at the bottom of the screen. They share these three values and offer these six healing narratives. Mutualism emphasizes that together we have what we need to flourish and that nourishment is a right of all people and all bodies. Reciprocity reminds us that care is the essence of all labor and food is relational. Belonging is a theme that resonates in resilience, social emotional learning and holistic wellness. Where our love for food and our care for our neighbor intersect, we should find these values and insist on these truths. Food Solutions New England is offering a 21 day racial equity challenge that starts in April. I would encourage you to look into it. Last year's material is archived if you want to get a flavor. But you can sign up and they'll send you material that you can use over 21 days or over 21 weeks. It doesn't matter to them as long as together we are learning and charting a course of action to dismantle racism in our food system and in our world. As I prepare to close out this presentation, I have a disclaimer, arguably one that I should have shared at the beginning. I am not a nutritionist, an economist, a social worker, a clinical psychologist, an environmentalist, or a political scientist, nor do I have academic background or credentials for all of what I share today. Some, but not all. All of this information is readily available for vetting and confirmation. 
And I also want to say that I'm grateful for the hundreds of dedicated, thoughtful professionals that I've met across our state already doing amazing food systems work. They gave me time and space to pick their brains and glean from their experiences and understandings, which has allowed me to compile this information today. I do my best not to insert my own opinions or values, but rather to let the research and the other experts speak for themselves. Part of the difficulty in this work is that you need a nutritionist, a social worker, a sheriff, faith leaders, educators, policymakers, healthcare workers, economists, social engineers, community planners. They all have to come together to have holistic conversations about community health and wellness. Food serves both as a source of great need and as a natural unifier. So perhaps interdisciplinary conversations can start around food issues and over time can mature into other areas of concern within our community. It takes that multidisciplinary approach to get at the heart of these big, complicated issues. That being said, there is a role for every person in every sector to contribute to community resilience. I shared with you what I'm not, but what I am as a mom, sincerely worried about who and what is driving important conversations like food and health. I worry about what systems will look like when my own kids start to survive on their own and they have their own families. What will food systems look like for my grandchildren, who I already love? Considering the changes that have occurred since my grandmother had her babies, if we don't change our current trajectory, who knows what that future will look like? I know I cannot make any real impact alone, but given this platform, maybe Together, we can shine a light on some things and spark interest in others. What I hope is that together we can make real change, sustainable, justice building, dignity giving, community strengthening change. So again, the work of Ending Hunger 2030 is to promote equitable access to healthy, culturally appropriate foods, really looking at the narrative wondering who's selling it, amplifying the voices of affected people, and focusing our collective responsibilities. We have to exercise those SEL muscles around our own feelings and perceptions, and then extend grace to our neighbor. I took this graphic from Maine Resilience Building Network, and that is their QR code. I think food security, or really any social issue, fits right in line with fostering resilience. There is a role for every sector, and if we can find a way to work together, then we can create communities that prevent and reduce stigma, empower and protect our neighbors, and by extension, ourselves, and improve holistic health and well-being throughout the neighborhoods in our state. I keep this barn raising picture on my desktop. I live next to the Amish and I am so amazed at how their community lives so simply and yet thrives and grows. They come together maybe once a month when the weather allows. The men build, the women cook and chat and watch over their kids. And this is just my outsider's observation. But they raise barns and in rotation for each family to expand business opportunities, to provide housing for more extended family, to bring in more animals. They invest in each other and together the whole community grows. Everyone takes one step forward together. Thank you for your time today. I've put my contact info on this last slide because I would absolutely love to hear from people who watch this presentation. If you have questions, want clarification on any of the resources I pieced together, want recommendations for good books or documentaries about justice, equity, food systems, historical and systematic oppression. I am a complete nerd for this stuff and would be thrilled to extend conversations to whomever is interested in engaging in dialogue. So I hope to hear from you, but either way, I hope you have a rest, a wonderful rest of your day and uh, enjoy all of the SEL activities planned for you here. Thank you and take care.